Welcome. As you're joining in, if you would drop your name and where you're from into the chat. But uh, before you do that, if you would go down to the two section in the chat and make sure it's set to panelists and attendees, that'll be sure that everybody can see. We can see what you're sharing and, and see who all is getting involved here. We'd love to be able to connect. This is also a way as we go through the session, as we get to the end, that you can ask some questions. You can use the Q&A feature at the bottom or use the chat. So we'll get started in just about two more minutes, but uh, would love for you to drop your name and where you're at into the chat as you sign in. Thanks folks for starting to sign in. You can uh, change it to panelists and attendees and uh, let us know who, uh, who you are, where you're at. Thanks for being a part of this. I can see Liz Rick from Hydrant Church. Thanks, so, so excited to be able to connect with you and got folks in Barbados and Georgia. Fantastic, so glad that you guys are, are joining us. Wow, love it. Folks from Czech Republic, Toronto, Nova Scotia, thanks for being a part of this today. But it looks like it is noon, so we're going to go ahead and jump right in and, um, and get going with today's session. My name is Tim, and I am, uh, I was the lead pastor, founding pastor at Hydrant Church in Goldsboro, North Carolina from 2012 until recently in 2021. And just this week stepped into a new role that uh, has shifted my attention from rethinking one church to helping other churches rethink and imagine what God would have them to do in their place. So I'm serving now as, uh, as the interim DS on the South Coastal District of the Wesleyan Church and they're getting to know some of the great pastors and see the churches and what God is doing in those places and excited about that. And one of the big pieces of, of seeing transformation in ourselves and in our churches is to rethink why. And so we're going to take some time today to talk a little bit about what it looks like to rethink why in our, in our lives, as well as what it looks like to rethink our church's why. So um, I just, again, thanks for joining us. If you find these sessions helpful, they will be posted on the WPH uh, YouTube site. Uh, we'll post them on, uh, on my website, timfox.online, where you can find information about the book or, or other things. And, and also, if these are helpful to you and you wanna dig in and provide some materials for your, your leaders and your lay people, then I'd encourage you to check out the Rethink Small Conference, rethinksmallconference.com. There you can find uh, digital resources covering lots of different areas of ministry, how to, how to facilitate excellent youth ministry and systems and kids ministry and outreach, discipleship, um, and wonderful guest experiences in a small church. So we'd love for you to check those out, Rethink Small Conference. And then again, you can check out my website if you want a little more information on the book. 
get connected to the WAPH store to pick that up. So we're gonna we're gonna jump in now into talking a little bit about rethinking why. For me, this was uh, critical. It began in um, mid 2013. Mid 2013, we started to ask this question of why. Why is our church here? Why is Goldsboro Wesleyan Church in this town, in this place in town, in this time in history with this group of people? Why are, why are we here? What are we supposed to be doing? What is our purpose? We have been going through the motions of ministry, doing the same things that that 90 percent of the churches around us are doing over and over again. We're not seeing people get baptized every year. We're not seeing people become believers. We're not seeing people uh, take steps of discipleship the way we believe that God would have us to. We're not influencing the planting of churches or the revitalization of churches in any real way. And we were just kind of struggling. And it's this this moment, we just kind of stopped and asked why. Why are we here? And in that, we began to reimagine what ministry could be. And that led us, if you've read the book, through the process of closing down Goldsboro Wesleyan Church and relaunching as Hydrant Church in late 2013. And as we went through that process, we began to Rethink why we did everything, why we decorated or uh, designed the building the way we did, what it communicated, how we had barriers up that were keeping people away. We, we asked the questions uh, of who we are and who we're meant to be, and we began to redesign the church in a way that could pursue what God had created it to pursue. Then about a year later, I was go in this in this process right we, we had we had relaunched we had reimagined we had rethought our why we were going after it with everything we knew how and and to be honest it wasn't working we had changed the music and the stage and the kids ministry and we had changed the name we had changed all of these things we're pursuing what we thought was our purpose what we thought God wanted us to be doing and yet it was getting nowhere we were smaller than we were before the restart. And, and I wondered if we were going to make it. In fact, one of our college students went away to Southern Wesleyan and said, will the church be here when I get back? And my honest answer was, I'm not sure. And I, I write in the book on page 100, I said, depression, fatigue, disappointment, and negativity were my close companions. I knew something had to change. We needed a breakthrough. Maybe you can relate. You've been in that season or are in a season where you, you feel like you need a breakthrough. You need God to do something miraculous, you need something to happen to move you toward stability or toward new life or out of the, the struggle that you're in at the moment. And I knew it that we needed a change and the breakthrough did come, but the change that came, it started in me. It started in me because while we had reimagined and began to think about why our church was in this place, we hadn't followed all the way through in that process. And so I came back to the question of why. Why are we here in this place? Why am I here in this place doing this work? And I think that part of the reason I was struggling with, with so many negative emotions when I was struggling with the depression and the fear and the anxiety and the, the, the negativity that was hitting me every single day is that I was pursuing something that really didn't quite fit. I was pursuing an idea of church that had maybe come as much from the culture and other churches around me than it had from scripture or from God's calling. I was having to, to go through something that pushed me to rediscover a part of our why that was not just being a church for people who don't know God yet, but, but had to take us even deeper. See, we had, as a church, begun to collectively rethink why, but I had only come to kind of a, a vague, generic, cliche idea of my own purpose and identity, and it was paired with a pursuit of a misunderstood definition of what I thought I was supposed to be doing as a pastor and as a leader. And, and frankly, my struggle, my misunderstanding 
my lack of self-awareness was not just hurting me and causing me pain. It was holding the church back. And I had to go through a process of rethinking my why, of rediscovering why, what God had for me, who God had made me to be, and, and why that mattered so that I could pursue and, and understand what I was supposed to be doing. You see, until we really can understand why, we're not going to understand what we're supposed to be doing. And until we understand what, we're not really going to know um, how we're going to do it. And then we can't set goals that tell us when to do it. It all has to begin and is built uh, and, and flows down from understanding our why. And before I could really dig into that, I had to give up. I had to give up lots of things. I had to give up other people's expectations. And maybe you say, I don't care what other people think. I'm going to do whatever I need to do. But the truth is, we all have those times and those people that we want to live up to their expectations. They have believed in us or invested in us. Maybe it's parents' expectations. And, and those can weigh us down and define where we're supposed to go. And the, and the hard thing about ministry or work in the church at, at any level, volunteer, bivocational, vocational, you know, pastors, leaders, whatever it is, we can connect those expectations to God. And, and it's what we think, what others have expected of us, what we have expected of ourselves suddenly becomes God's expectation of us. And when we can't live into those expectations, we really feel that sense of failure, not just of letting ourselves down or letting other people down, but we feel like we've let God down. And maybe the truth is those expectations never came from God. And they need to go back and let them go so that we can rediscover ourselves. I had to let go of my own unholy ambitions and desires my own unholy ambitions and desires that were driven by motivations that, that weren't really about God and his kingdom or the church or other people, but they were about me. And, and those can sneak into us, in, into our minds and into our hearts without us even realizing it. We want to be perceived a certain way. We want to accomplish certain things and, and they make us feel better about who we are and our identity gets connected to our performance and these unholy ambitions and desires grow up and you've got to let them go. You got to let go. I had to let go of my own delusions, my delusions of grandeur, my delusions about being the, the one out of 500 that will blow things up and it'll go from zero to 500 to a thousand in a couple of weeks. You know, I had to let go of these delusions about what I thought I was capable of. Um, I, I tell the story of the book. I tell it all the time. So we've got a couple of people here who've been on staff with me, and they'll they'll recognize this story and, and will probably roll their eyes and and sigh right now. But the there was this moment where I was standing in front of the church complaining to God uh, about the number of people there, and He just said to me, "Son, you're not that good. You just need to love and serve and teach the people." that I've entrusted to you and you let me take care of the empty seats and these delusions about what I thought I was capable of. And maybe one day I would be capable of those things. But at that moment, there was growth that needed to happen. And I had to let go of my own ideas so that I could discover what God was wanting to do in that place. My own ideas of what validated ministry of, of what made for a good church of what made for a successful pastor and rediscover what those meant. And that meant for me, that as I gave those up, I entered into darkness. Really, I, I had to go and enter into my own story, my own heartbreaking loss and suffering, and, and, and go into those stories again, write them down, tell them in such a way that, that I can see that God was bringing me through something that would give me the courage to go through what was ahead. I had to, I had to lean in to my own failures and weaknesses to discover that those things don't ultimately define us. They are not the last word. They don't, they don't tell us who we are. You see, once our identity gets rooted and seated in God, we can do whatever he's asking us to do, success or failure, because we know that his love for us is the same either way. His embrace of us is the same either way. His approval of us is the same either way. We just do whatever he asks us to do, and we, we trust the results to him knowing 
that that failure is the learning opportunity. It's not the end. So we can succeed or fail, but we have to do whatever he asks us to do. And that's only really possible once we move past our expectations, our ambitions and desires and ideas and delusions and allow him to meet us in our weakness and in our failures and in our loss and suffering. From there, it really took going into and embracing obscurity. There's a whole chapter on this idea, and so I don't want to uh, lean into it too far, but there is something remarkable that happens in the seasons of obscurity when God places us in a hidden season, a hidden place where, where our character can grow and our skills can grow and our understanding of ourselves can grow. And that was what really had to happen before anything else. I had to learn who I am. You see, at the heart of rethinking your why personally or as a church is getting to know yourself, getting to know yourself. And that may seem kind of kind of a strange thing to say. It may seem out of the blue, it may not really seem all that helpful, but statistically, most of us don't know ourselves. Uh, Tasha Yurick writes in her book, Insight, the surprising truth about how others see us, how we see ourselves and why the answers matter more than we think. She writes that our data reveals that 95% of people believe they are self-aware, but the real number is 12 to 15%. She says that means on a good day, about 80% of people are lying about themselves to themselves. We're not really honest about who we are because we haven't taken the time to get to know who God made us to be, what he has put in us and how he has designed us so that we can live into that identity. I talk a lot about trying to help others to be who they were created to be so that they can do what they were created to do. We've got to understand how God created us. Really that proverb which says to raise up a child in the way they should go and they won't depart from them is not about teaching them God's ways, but it's about helping them to discover who God made them to be. So we have to take the time to really get to know ourselves. If we're going to rethink our why discover our purpose, know our vision, develop a strategy that will move us forward. And that, there are, I think, five things that kind of overlap in circles that reveal what God is asking us to do. And the first of those is your story. Your story. You see, uh, Donald Miller, actually today in a video about the best thing, the one most important thing to help you move from who you are to who you believe you are meant to be, is writing down your story, going back and writing down your story, because most of us perceive ourselves negatively. And we need to go back and write out those stories, not for publication or not to share necessarily with anyone, but in writing them out, we see what God has been doing and how he has moved us through those moments and prepared us for what we are doing and facing now. We see the things that have hurt us and wounded us that can be used for ministry. We see our, our successes. We see the things we have learned and, and how God has been developing us so that we have the courage to do what he's asking us to do right now. The second, the second thing that kind of overlaps is this, this um, our, our gifts, strengths, passions, personality. I kind of lump those all together because we've got to take the time to understand our strengths and our struggles. We've got to take the time to understand the spiritual gifts that God has given us. And those may change over time and develop, but if we don't know what they are, we can't work on improving them. You see, strengths, gifts, personality, those are gifts from God to you to do whatever he's asked you to do. But you give a gift back to him when you develop your strengths, when you develop your personality, when you develop your abilities, when you when you manage those weaknesses or those struggles so they don't become a liability that hurts you. The next is your burdens. What keeps you up at night? What is it wrong in the world that you just can't stand, that you know you have to do something about? What brings you to tears? What makes you angry? Because when you're burdened, your passion grows and you're able to step into and follow through with an energy and a resilience that you're not going to find any other way. The next is your values. And I encourage you, you can go online. Uh, Brene Brown has one on her website. You can download a page as a list of like a hundred different values that many people have. 
and work. Spend the time to narrow down your values. What is most important to you? And, and maybe the, take the time to narrow that down to the two most important values for you. What are the most important things that you value more than anything else? And, and the first time you go through that list, you'll probably get it down to about 10. It'll take you another hour or so to get it down to five. And then eventually you can narrow it down to two and really pray through and think through those things and let those shape how you understand yourself and what it is you're supposed to be doing. And then finally is your calling. We all are called by God. It, um, some are called into vocational ministry. Some are called into the marketplace. Some are called into the school. Some are called into the home as, as stay-at-home parents. These are all valid, wonderful, God-seated callings. And we've got to understand that. If we don't really have a strong sense of what I am called to, then I'm not going to be able to do the things that he wants me to do. I'm not going to understand how my values and my calling and my burdens and my story overlap to create a place of ministry for me in the world, a place where I can effectively make a difference, a place where what God has put in me meets the needs of those around me, and we can really do something significant in the name of God, for the kingdom of God, for the people who don't know him yet. And so we can, we can spend some time getting to know ourselves, and that'll allow us to rethink our why. That's ultimately what you're doing when you start to take time to rethink your why. Many of us have accepted a why. We've accepted a purpose. We've accepted an identity that didn't come from God, that hasn't been sought out in ourselves. We have no idea where it came from. We have this definition of, of being a leader or being a pastor that, that just came from someone else that was a leader or a pastor for us. We have this understanding of what it means to be a Christian or follower of God. And many of us, we have absorbed this definition from places other than God in scripture. We have absorbed an understanding of who we are from our family of origin, from uh, the experiences of our past, from people who have said and done things that hurt us from our own failures. And we need to stop and rethink that why. Rethink who we are so that we can do what we were created to do. Now, this is a process that we have to go through as a church. Churches have stories too. Churches have history. The only time that your church doesn't is on launch day. On your very first day as a church, you've not yet developed the story and you've not yet been through the wounds and the hurts, but they're coming. They're a part of it. And so you've got to take the time to go back and understand your church. You've got to listen. You've got to observe. You've got to dig in and rethink why this church is here. It's not just here to reach everyone in our community because you're not going to do that. Why has God placed you in your church in this season, in this community, at this time in history? And understand that sense of identity and calling so deeply that it shapes everything else. It shapes the vision. It shapes the strategy. It shapes the goals. It shapes how you spend money. Look, we have to, we have to be about more than numbers numbers that we report to our district or to our leaders. And I get that suddenly I'm now on the other side of that reporting and, and inviting and asking for those numbers. But the truth, the truth is those numbers are not nearly as significant as we make them out to be. And we can say things like, oh, we count because people count, but that doesn't make people feel like they count. It doesn't make people feel like they're loved and matter when you translate them into a number. We have to be about more. We have to rediscover why we're here. Ezekiel really helps me when I think about this. Um, and it really challenges me too. Ezekiel was, uh, was a young man who trained to serve in the temple as a priest and then was brought into exile in Babylon. And as he's there now, about 30 years old, and basically a new pastor trained to do ministry in one world and put in a new world. He looks and you know what he sees? He sees the people of God gathering down by the river and they are singing the old songs and they're telling the old stories and they're waiting for God to come rescue them. And that's all they're doing. That's all they're doing. They're going down by the river, singing the old songs, telling the old stories, just reminding themselves and hoping for the day that God comes and rescues them. And God begins to speak through Ezekiel 
through crazy visions of a, of a God on this, on this remarkable chariot that can go anywhere, revealing that God is now with them in this new world and that he has more for them to do. The illustrations uh, that, that Ezekiel used, I don't recommend in you know, doing any of his bodily um, illustrations, mimicking him. But we've got to understand that the world has changed and we can't just simply gather up in our little churches, singing our songs, telling our stories, waiting for Jesus to come back again. That is not what he's asked us to do. It wasn't what he asked God's people to do in Babylon. He told them to go work for the good of the city, to build homes, to get married, to, to build plant gardens, to invest in the world around them, be the witness of God in that place. And that is our calling. We have to go like Ezekiel into this crazy world around us that doesn't understand us, that doesn't share our values, doesn't share our stories, doesn't share our priorities. And we got to reown this identity as the people of God, not hiding in our churches, waiting for Jesus to come back. We need to be about the work of the kingdom. We need to be about seeing the kingdom of God come to bear on earth as it is in heaven. We need to be the agents, the ambassadors of that kingdom. And our churches have to rediscover that mission and purpose. We got to rediscover our why that is so much bigger and so much more than simply telling the old stories, singing the old songs, and waiting for Jesus to take us to heaven. So it begins in the same way it begins for us personally. It's, it's understanding the church's story. Go back and look at the ups and the downs, the setbacks, the struggles, the victories. What has shaped your church into what it is in this moment? Maybe there are things that you need to confess as a church. Maybe there, there's repentance that needs to happen. Maybe there is an abandonment of the mission that has happened. Maybe there's a call to something new that needs to happen. Maybe it's just a, an awakening. We falling in love with Jesus so much that we fall in love with the people of our community. Then you can begin to look, what are the church's abilities and passions and resources? What is God gifted and put into this church? What facilities do we have? What resources do we have? What money do we have? What location do we have? What, what skills do we have? What do we care about as a church? The part, church that I was a part of at, at Hydrant, and Liz led this really well, was uh, we had a passion and a burden and, and a connection, a resource to provide food for those in need in our community. So we started a food pantry. We didn't do a clothing closet. That wasn't how he passioned us and resourced us. We did what he was put in us to do. And you can begin to look at what's already happening in church. What are you already good at? What do you already care about? What resources do you already have? And who has God, God gathered in your church for unique ministry in that time and in that place? Who has God gathered together? What is the body of Christ that he has put together? Listen, if you don't have any musicians, he didn't call you to have a band. If, if you don't have the, 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 the people to do certain ministries, you don't need to manufacture it or try to do something poorly. As small churches, especially, let's just be honest, any church, we have limited resources. We have a limited number of people and time and limited number of, of, of facilities and, and we've got to use them intentionally. So what is it and who is it that God has put in your place to do something unique? And then what are the needs in your community? Don't just jump to what you think the needs are or how you could think you could help or what the church ought to be doing. Instead, we need to listen. Listen before we serve. What are the spiritual, emotional, physical, relational, practical needs of the people that God has called us to reach? And how can we serve them well? And so then you can begin to get creative about how your, your passions and gifts and strengths match up with those needs of the community. Get creative. This is the last thing. Get creative. Look, hold on to the essentials, the essential activities, beliefs, and mission of the church. Those are non-negotiable. Those come from Jesus. But your worship order didn't come from Jesus. The design of your building didn't come from Jesus. This order of ministries that you have chosen or have been going on for five or 10 or 50 years, it didn't come from Jesus. We have to go back and hold on to those things that did come from him, the activities and beliefs and mission that are instilled in us that are at the center, but then get creative about how you live those out. 
What is your particular calling in those as a church that you can do? You have permission as leaders called by God and placed in the church to get creative and use your imagination and let the spirit guide you as a people into doing something remarkable that meets a need. Listen, if what you were doing right now was working, would you have the results you have? Or would you have different results? God is asking us to follow him. Just do what he asks you to do. And the last thing before we kind of open this up for questions is uh, I want you to focus as a part of this on the real area your church needs to grow. Focus on the real area that your church needs to grow. If we look at Acts chapter two, in the early days of the church, it grew in four ways. You see, it tells us there that they devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles, to prayer, to eating together, to meeting the needs of those around them, and that through those things, they began to get, gain favor with those around them, and then God added to their number every day. There are four types of growth in this passage. The first is a growth in maturity. The growth in maturity, a growth in, in their spiritual connection to God and an understanding of who they were as followers of Jesus and, the, and devoting themselves to the teaching of the apostles and to prayer, to being together was how they began that process of maturity. And then they grew in unity. Let's be honest, one of the big things holding a lot of our churches back is a lack of unity, a lack of clear, unifying purpose and vision and identity. And we need to, to come back together, come back and grow in our unity because we can't grow in any other way until we grow in our maturity and we grow in our unity. And if you do those things, then you will grow in favor with those around you. You will grow in, in an understanding of the needs of those around you. And you'll begin then, like I said, to meet the needs of those inside and outside the church. And that will lead to a growth in favor. And then ultimately God brings the growth in numbers. And it may not be hundreds, but I believe that as we are faithful with small things, that he has said that he will entrust us with more and more. He will entrust us with more and more. But where is it that we really need to grow? Maturity? Does your, does your church right now need to redevote itself in this season to the, to the teachings of scripture, to prayer, to gathering together? Does it need to grow in unity as you come back together out of this COVID season, before you're reaching out, before you're trying to, to grow in numbers, before you're inviting anyone in, do you need to grow in maturity or unity first? Do you need to let that lead into favor with the community? And then trust God to lead into the growth of numbers. So focus, what really needs to happen right now in your church? What area do you really need to grow? Simple ways to kind of get started in this process while you are rethinking your why. So thank you uh, for being a part. Thank you for listening. We have a few minutes for questions. So if you want to type those in to the panelists and attendees chat, or you can uh, send them to the Q&A and Maria will get those to me. But uh, love to be able to connect with you. As you are starting to type those up, we want to share that Connie Stewart is our giveaway winner today. So um, watch for an email from Marie at, uh, at WPH and she will talk to you about how to, uh, to receive and get connected to that giveaway and take advantage of that. So we're so glad that each of you were a part today. Like I said, we're gonna start taking questions. So go ahead and type those in. If you have questions about rethinking your why, about our process, about my process, about what God is uh, wanting to do. So just um, drop those questions in. Remember, you can uh, connect more to content about rethinking your church and rethinking the ministries of church in a way that is effective in making disciples and reaching others by uh, going to um, the Rethink Small Conference page, rethinksmallconference.com. Real inexpensive way to download 22 HD videos from leaders across not just the Wesleyan Church, but others, and be able to connect with others uh, and, and to, to learn more about how to rethink why. You can also uh, pick up the book at the WPH store, wphstore.com, where uh, or Amazon, whatever works best for you. We'd love for you to uh, to do that. Um, okay, a quick question. Um, please share the name of the author and book you spoke 
of as resource for values. Um, oh, Brene Brown, Brene Brown has a book, uh, really in just about every book she writes, uh, she talks about um, values and understanding your values. The book Dare to Lead by Brene Brown is the one I would recommend uh, jumping into as you discover uh, empathy and values and leading out of those things. You can, if you just search for a list of values by Brene Brown, you can find that in Google, on Google as well. Yep. The other book that I referenced was Insight by Tasha Urich, E-U-R-I-C-H. We have a few more minutes. I'll wait for questions that comes. I'll share. Marie and I were talking a little bit. Marie works with uh, the Westland Publishing House and has put this uh, webinar together. Very grateful for them and their willingness to do this. They're, they're incredible and have been great to work with throughout the whole process and through these webinars today. So um, just grateful for that. We were talking a little bit about that quote from, from Tasha Yurik and this reality that so many of us are, are going through life with a low self-awareness. Um, and, and so it was, it was just this remarkable thing to, to recognize that, that emotional intelligence is the key, is the key to, to really unlocking our potential in any area of work or ministry, as we understand ourselves and are able to respond to that and understand others and respond to that makes all the difference. Somebody asked, can you go over the, the growth in maturity for churches again? Yeah. Absolutely. So um, I mentioned that right at the end, four areas of growth from Acts chapter two. The first is maturity, the growth in maturity, growth in our understanding of the word, growth in our connection to God, growth in our devotion to the things that matter to God. Because sometimes it's easy to get stuck in what we think the church should do based on what we want. And when we become mature in our faith, we begin to prioritize uh, the church around the things that matter most to God. So growth and maturity is first. Um, the, the second is growth in unity, growth in unity. Um, so as we grow in unity, then we begin to reflect what it really means to be a disciple. I mean, it's so important that that was the thing that Jesus prayed about. Jesus prayed that we would be unified and said, that's what's really going to identify us in the world. And yet it doesn't mark very many of our churches. So we grow in our maturity and our unity, which then leads to serving those around us and we grow in favor. Some of the ways that we grow in favor is as we serve outside of our church, we've got to go in that mission. So we meet the needs of those around us. But if you are going to do that inside your property as well, then part of that means designing your property in a way that communicates love for guests, communicates expectation of their arrival that is prepared and values them and the journey they're on, as well as valuing Jesus and the message of Jesus. It's not just about what we love, but it's there for others. And then ultimately it's God who adds to numbers. A lot of us need to go back though to the very beginning as a church. We need to go back to um, what it looks like to um, really engage in a love for Jesus. And so uh, as we rediscover that, it makes all the difference in our ability to cast vision and move forward toward those other levels of growth. Uh, someone asked in the last webinar, you mentioned about gearing your church to a place where men particularly would feel comfortable. Could you talk about the process of getting your church to this man-friendly place? <laughs> so part of the advantage I had and was that we did a complete shutdown and relaunch, but there were some battles. We had a room full of those fake flowers. I mean, a whole room devoted to the storage of flowers to be spread out around the building, doilies all over the place. I had pastor in another church that had mauve or pink carpet and pews and chairs and everything was pink. And it was just this really kind of flowery place. And, and that's not necessarily a knock. It's just that we had a tendency to place the responsibility for decorating or communicating what we're about to women. And so they've created a place that they felt comfortable in at home the way they did at home. And there's no knock on that. The problem is that men don't always feel comfortable in those places. And, and that 
there's this just simple stat that drove this for me is that is that when you win a man you win a family when you win a man you win a family if you don't win dad it doesn't take long before the church or for the family follows dad if dad is not in church if dad is not connected to the gospel if dad is not involved in what's happening if dad is not following jesus then it becomes infinitely more difficult for the family to continue to follow Jesus apart from him. It's not impossible. It happens all the time, but it is a challenge. So we decided to intentionally, intentionally target men to, to dress in a way as a church that created a place that men felt comfortable to be themselves. We decided to design the our, the logos, design the mailers, everything in a way that would reflect a more masculine design. In the building, that meant lots of wood and steel and, and things like that. There were no flowers anywhere, no doilies, no extra little tables, things out for no reason kind of thing. So one of the things for us was it connected to that vision of reaching men. And when people bought into that and we began to see God reach them in and bring families to him, it, it just fueled it and gave us more and more permission to continue to go down that path. But take the little things, start small. Don't worry about being ultra modern. Don't worry about um, having to be the cutting edge of everything. Do classic, comfortable environments. But that for me, it, it really makes a difference if it is going to be a place that men comfortable if a if a guy wants to come to church there aren't a whole lot of wives who are going to fight him other questions got about five more minutes somebody has a question Thanks, Marie. Marie has posted there in the comments for you those four areas of growth that we shared at the end. Do you, I want to go back as a, if, if you guys don't have questions, if you pop one in there, I will ask it. But uh, all right, I'll, I'll ask it and try my best to respond. But um, on this idea of getting creative, uh, it's okay if your church doesn't look like every other church around you. It's okay if you don't do everything that you think a church has done for a long time there are things that maybe are actually moving you sideways now they used to work they used to be remarkable evangelistic tools they used to be incredible outreach tools incredible ministry things but they don't work anymore but we're still doing them it's okay to stop doing them it's okay to be the first one to stop doing them it's okay to streamline yourselves to the things that you are good at and focus on the things that you're good at as a church and as a person. It doesn't mean you can't ignore other things that you need to do. Like you probably can't put together a worship service without any music, but it doesn't mean you have to sing three or four or five songs every week if you don't have the musicians or the singers or the ability to do that. And you don't have to put them right at the beginning of your service. You can put what you're really great at at the beginning end with something that you're really great at so that you create that bookend of, of a positive experience and environment where they can hear the gospel. There is this level of excellence, and that doesn't mean perfection. It means that we're constantly working to improve and offer our very best, bring our best, whatever that looks like today to today. And as we do that, just here, if nothing else, there is room to be creative and permission to do what God is asking you to do. All right. Well, if there are not any other questions, I want to just say thank you one more time for joining us today. It has been a privilege to share some time with you. We hope that you have a great day. You guys are incredible. We believe in you and believe in what's happening in your churches. Continue to follow him. Keep rethinking why. Have a great day.